Hi, and welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. I'm Mel Barnes. On this show, I'll be speaking to Hall Greenland from the Greens and Peter Boyle from Socialist Alliance about the issues they'll be campaigning on in the upcoming federal election. And later, we'll hear from Carlo Sands. Hall Greenland is a journalist, community organiser and founding member of the Greens, and he's the Greens candidate for the seat of Granla. Peter Boyle is a national co-convener of Socialist Alliance and has been involved in countless community campaigns since the 1970s. And he's the Socialist Alliance candidate for the seat of Sydney. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for Thank coming. Thank you. Thanks. So I just wanted to start off by asking you first of all, what are the issues that you'll be campaigning on? I'll be saying to the electorate is that it's the most progressive electorate in the country. You should have the most progressive MP in Parliament. At present, you haven't. You've got somebody who continues to support a government, well, it's a pillar of that government, which continues to follow Howard era policies. Part of a government's going to raise more from cutting single parents' families than from the mining tax, who can't even do the decent thing about Julian Assange, and who is facilitating an enormous expansion in our coal exports. Wherever you look, We've got a representative in Grainler that doesn't represent the views of the majority of electors. So you've already been out talking to, to people, door knocking and that kind of thing. And, and what are the issues that they've been bringing up with well, you? Well, they're raising those kind of issues. Yeah. They're raising marriage equality. They're raising public education. They're raising the intervention. They're raising the refugees. They're yeah. raising, raising a whole range of attitudes. I mean, I must admit, lots of them are really scared. And uh, I share this fear the possibility of an Abbott Liberal government. But what I've been saying to them is, you know, we need a big influx of Greens to strengthen the backbone of a Labor Party that's lost its way. And Peter, what about you? What are the issues you'll be campaigning on? Well, Socialist Alliance is trying to shift the discussion a little bit because we're, we're, we're trapped in this horrible lesser evil choice, which is really no choice. I mean, they're both evils and they're both pretty much on the same agenda. And we're trying to put forward what might seem like a, a, a radical solution, but really isn't that radical. We're saying that uh, for us to move forward on a number of fronts in this country, we need to take a decisive step by nationalising the mining sector, the energy sector and the banking sector. Now, it seems a bit extreme in a way, but it wasn't always considered this way. You know, in fact, I think politics has shifted so much that people forget that after the Second World War, for instance, the idea of the people taking control of a major sector of society, of the economy, uh, was actually a very popular one. Now, we need it for a number of reasons, not least climate change. It is not possible to seriously envisage making a turn just on the question of climate change within the context of the current owners of the mining sector, of the energy sector, and the banks still controlling uh, those areas. It has to be brought into the hands of the people. Then you have the money to make the investment in renewable energy and public transport and a whole range of other transitions that urgently need to be made. I mean, the Greens pointed out last week that we could actually use the money that's been spent on subsidies to the fossil fuel industry um, and to the big miners like um, Clive Palmer and Gina Reinhart. We could spend the same amount of money increasing the New Start allowance by $50 a week. We could give an extra 10% um, base funding to universities, spend $50 million on a grant scheme for more childcare centres, support single parents, and that would cost, we could do all of that and that would cost less than the, the subsidies that we're giving to these big coal miners. So it's interesting that the, the Greens are raising that kind of thing, but I mean, what do you think about the nationalisation campaign? The Greens go so far as to want much more democratic control of the economy. Christine Milne's on record as saying she is sick of a situation where the mining corporations own the parliament. The Greens are for a much more democratic uh, uh, control of the economy, including mining, including banking, including energy. And you're right. I mean, if the mining tax is even suggested by Kevin Rudd and Ken Henry had been implemented, we would be getting something like 25 to $30 billion over the for the four-year forward estimates. Mm. Now we're looking at getting two or three billion dollars. The mining companies just ran over the Labor government and we're paying for it. Adam Bant is, uh, has uh, proposed a super tax on the banks. The big four banks' profits have increased by 46% over the last four years. Mm. They are enormously profitable institutions. Mm. Their profits in the next four or five years will be in the vicinity of $150 billion. Now that qualifies in my mind to, for a super tax. Our tax base is shrinking 
drinking, and yet these corporations are running riot as far as the ripping off of the public, of our resources. And the Greens are quite upfront about it. Yeah, well, I mean, the government, instead of doing that, want to implement big cuts that will make university students in Australia pay a lot more for their education. They've also cut um, welfare payments to single parents. I mean, it seems like there's a class war yeah, happening in this it, country. It definitely <laughs> is. The idea that's being sold to most people is that money isn't there when this is patently mm. untrue. Absolutely. Now, I was thinking the other day, you look at those education cuts that Julia Gillard brought up, supposedly to help pay for the high school sector. You know, she's got to cut 2.5, 2.7 billion from tertiary sector. Mm. At the same time, she's actually increasing the public subsidy to private schools by 2.5 billion over four years. There's an $85 billion subsidy to private schools that's part of her education revolution. I mean, it's ridiculous. You know, these mining companies, they've got away with a 400% increase in profits over the last 10 years. And in that time, the proportion they're paying in taxes and royalties has gone down from about 40% to 13.9%. I mean, it's daylight robbery. Absolutely, daylight robbery. And it is starving. Uh, the you know the education sector, for instance, a billion dollar was take, taken off the of the university sector last year, and as mm. you said, they're planning to take another two or three billion dollars. We rank 25th in the top 29 developed nations as far as spending on universities is concerned. The TAFE center, the sector, is being dismantled and starved of funds and privatised and so on. I mean, this is a rich country, and yet there is nothing we seem to be able to take for granted anymore that we grow up with. Mm. free tertiary education, whether it was university or TAFE. You know, we could afford it 20, 30 years ago. And as you say, the wealth is there, but the political will, the will of a democracy to tax it, is not there yet. And that's one of the things that the Greens, and I dare say the Socialist Alliance, want the next parliament to do. And we will only do it if we get the support of mass and social movements outside, because, you know, these are pretty powerful opponents or enemies, if you like, that we have. We do need something like a citizen's revolution for the great transformation I think this society is crying out for. We have an incredible amount of wealth buried under the ground that is generating incredible profits for the Gina Reinhardts and so on. At the same time, we're seeing this massive attack on public services, community services and so on, under the lie that we don't have the money for it. We've clearly got all the wealth. It's right there and it's being taken from us. At the moment, the way it works is that a company flogs workers to death until that industry is no longer viable and then they, they just hop out and go and do something else and leave all the workers floundering. The mining industry in particular is ripping off Australian working class people blind. What we need to be doing is getting those industries under our control, not just under the state control but under the whole of the community's control to assess what our priorities are. Our COA, aluminium industry, is governed by a board in New York. They're not going to come up with a, a, a permanent pay plan and a retraining plan for all their workers. They're just one day going to announce, oh, it's not viable anymore, we're opting out. Fuck the rest of you. Over in Latin America at the moment, the predominant public mood is for more public ownership. And in a number of countries, including Argentina, where they've taken over the Spanish oil company YPF, they've taken over Argentina Aerolineas, the airline, which was almost bankrupt and now is thriving. I've just come back from Venezuela and you can see that it is possible to take back ownership and control of the wealth of the country, basically, and put it for the benefit of the vast majority of the people. If we had democratic control over the mining sector, we would be able to really work on our ailing health system. We could uh, invest much more in our education system and we certainly would have sufficient money available to really work out on how we can deal with climate change. Take back the wealth! Take back the wealth! Workers would share in the billions and billions and billions of dollars worth of profits that are coming out at the moment. Well, if workers could share in that, all our schools would be free. We wouldn't have any waiting lists in our hospitals. And to two or three people who currently get all those billions and billions and billions of dollars wouldn't have a yacht in the Mediterranean.
Is there a case for this? I just want to bring up another issue, which is, I think it's certainly the big, a big moral issue that we take to this elections, refugees, the scapegoating of refugees. Now, one side of it's pretty obvious, and I think, you know, Hall and I would, you know, we're on the same side here. We're against the racism and the, the cynical scapegoating of, of refugees. Mm. But the real question that lies beneath it is why are they doing this? And why does it work? And, and it works because a lot of people, despite the fact that this is a country that's been, you know, having continuous growth for the last period, people don't feel that secure. People do feel squeezed. They do feel it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, they do feel stressed, and they're looking around for solutions to that. They can be misled and diverted by racism and so on and by scapegoating, but I think, and you know, the surveys done on popular opinion is that there is a social democratic majority in this country. Most people, as you said, know that deregulation was for the corporations. They know privatisation was for, you know, the rich, and they know it. These kind of moves of economic neoliberalism have increased inequalities of power, of income, of wealth. They're aware of all those things. I'm still waiting for somebody in the Labor Party to break ranks on, uh, on something like Julian yeah. Assange or single mother pensioner cuts and so on. Well, I've given it, up waiting. You've given up waiting, but, <laughs> you know, well, you know, I was born in the Labor Party. I've still yeah. got residual fetishes and yeah. utopian hopes. Unless we can yeah, bring totally. large sections of the labour movement that still have some well, that kind of That actually brings me to the, my next question, um, which is, is about Tony Abbott. And going by the opinion polls, it, it seems likely that a Tony Abbott government will, will get in. And, and like what you said before, it is kind of a horrific thought to, to many of us, many progressive people in Australia, because we know the kind of cuts and the kind of attacks that will come. You said a negative warning campaign probably will not be enough. It will require some promises of a better, easier life. It will need to be hopeful as well as defensive. And it seems to me that it can only be offered by Labor and the Greens presenting some kind of united front program. The program I suggested was around the economy, around you know, proper taxation and around public enterprise. The NBN shouldn't be floated. We should strengthen the cooperative sector. We should have a state bank. The emphasis should be on uh, public schools and withdrawing aid certainly to the wealthiest private schools, a decent social security system, foreign policy that refuses to toady to the Americans and gets out of Afghanistan, to allow people longer annual leave, compassionate leave and so on. We're looking for a better life, a better future, another world. I believe it's possible. I think that great transformation to the you know, decarbonised, democratic, socially kind of useful economy can occur. I'm looking to a different kind of front because I think it's probably unlikely that anything is going to prevent Abbott from winning the next election. And that will bring a tax on that we can have no doubt about it. Britain currently, there's a new initiative for a People's Assembly against austerity. I've been trying to think, is it possible for it to happen in Australia now? And I think sadly, not until, not until we have the pain of an Abbott government on the attack because I cannot see the forces now. Where are they? They're just not there. They're, they're dug down. They say, you know, you've got no choice. If you don't want Abbott, you take what the Labor Party offers. I do think right now the best government we can get is a minority Labor government. It's much better than an Abbott government. I think the Greens had no choice and I think they played a, a, a pretty positive role in that agreement with uh, Labor. I think, and I think they realised this, and a debate went on inside the party, I think, that perhaps we should have been more critical, more of a catalyst than we were, and I think that's been recognised. And I think next time there's a minority Labor government and we support it, the price we extract will be higher. And just one final point, I'm, I mean, I'm an incorrigible optimist, Peter. I don't resign myself to a Abbott government. It hasn't been elected yet. I believe there's a social democratic green majority 
in the country. I don't believe people, are, the people, the majority of people are as reactionary as the Abbott Liberals. I believe there's still a chance to win the election September the 14th. That's why you fight elections, to arouse people, to educate them, to try and com combine them in order to win elections and prepare the ground for a better future. And if we lose, then we have formed the basis for a fighting resistance and a basis for a comeback in the future. Do you think there's pressure on the Greens to actually move more to the right? Oh, um, all the time there's that yeah. pressure from the mainstream and from yeah. the establishment and so on. But right now, I'm pleased to say there's pushback and there's resistance. The Greens are taking a much sharper and more radical position on all the questions of the, of the day, whether it's refugees or climate change or taxation, mining. It's a joy to be involved in the Greens campaign now. We are taking on the establishment, we are taking on the Abbott Liberals, and we are taking on the Gillard government. Final thoughts? So we're going to keep raising this question. You know, it's the question basically of public control. Public control of the major resources of society. And not just to you know, share the wealth around, but also to address the ecological crisis because I think there's no more time to waste. And we're going to put this on the agenda straight away, you know, in the form of a discussion to the extent that we can as a social alliance, which I think has to be had sooner or later. Great. Thank you so much for both of you for coming. Been a pleasure. And now let's hear from Carlo Sands. G'day, I'm Carlo Sands. And welcome to my corner. Recently, Shell announced plans to sell its Geelong refinery in defence of its bottom line, throwing into doubt the viability of more than 400 jobs. Now Shell has already closed a refinery in New South Wales and Caltex has shut one down in Queensland at the cost of more than a thousand jobs. But you know what? The key thing is, the key reason we've got to let these fossil fuel corporate giants continue their practices, threatening to destroy all life on planet Earth? They create jobs. I mean, sure, obviously, obviously not the hundreds of jobs they throw onto the scrap heap, throw human lives onto the scrap heap at a moment's notice, destroying entire towns using the same profit first logic by which they threaten the ability of planet Earth to sustain modern civilized life. I mean, yeah, of course, of course, not those jobs, obviously. It'd be ironic though, wouldn't it? If we let them kill the earth and turns out there was no jobs, how stupid would we feel? I mean, oh, oh, if only, if only we had challenged corporate power and created a, a green job rich economy. <laughs> but if we do let them kill the planet in pursuit of corporate profits, it, at least we can take heart that they, they use their wealth generated from such destructive practices in, in socially, socially useful fashion, such as billionaire mining magnate Clive Palmer's plans to build a giant robotic dinosaur theme park on the Gold Coast. You can't buy class like that. I'm Carlos Sands, and that was my corner. Thanks, Carlo. <laughs> That's all for the Green Left Report for this episode. Please consider a donation to keep this radical media project alive and subscribe to the Green Left TV YouTube channel for the latest films and interviews. Goodbye. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. Dare to struggle, dare to fight. Workers of the world.